Welcome back to another episode of Susan Lopresti, Mind, Body, and Soul, the podcast where we explore the highs, the lows, and everything in between when it comes to a woman's life, her health, and all aspects of navigating the midlife landscape. I'm your host, Susan Lopresti, and today I am super excited about my very special guest. Not only is she a very special guest, but I also consider her to be a very special friend, my dear friend, Angelina Barbieri. And all her friends know her as Angie. I met Angie about 15 years ago. I believe that it was probably in like 2007 or 2008, somewhere around that time. And we met through a very dear mutual friend of ours. And this is a really crazy story because one Friday night, I was going to my friend Diane's house right after work, and I was taking the Long Island Railroad directly to our house. And I was on the train, and this stunning woman walks through the train and I look up and I see this beautiful woman. She's got this long flowing hair. She has these gorgeous sunglasses on that like were studded and really attractive. And she just walks through the train car into the next car. And I just thought, wow, she's like really stunning. Like I could feel her energy. It was crazy. There was just something about her that I immediately looked at her and got this energy from her. Anyway, long story short, I get off the train, I go to Diane's house, and I'm in her apartment like five minutes, and the doorbell rings, and Diane says, oh, that's my friend Angelina, she's coming over too tonight, I can't wait for you to meet her. And in walks the girl that was on the railroad, and it was like, no more than five minutes after I was in Diane's house that she walked in and it was just crazy. So Diane introduced me and we started chatting and I said to Angelina, I just saw you on the railroad. Were you on the railroad? And you were like, yes, I was. And we just developed like this connection and this mutual friendship. And, you know, part of it is like Diane and I are both in a lot of ways, we're still very young at heart. And Angelina is a little bit of an old soul. So I think the combination between the two of us or the three of us really work together because I'm sure that Diane and I are older than even your mom, right, Ange? Like, <laughs> but there was that <laughs> definite con connection and it's been like that ever since. Anyway... Like I said, even though she's much younger than us and we just seem to connect. And although Angie is now in California and our lives are completely different, we still are connected and we still have the same love that we always did, even though we're on two different entirely, you know, points in our life. I mean, Angelina's raising children and my daughter's 30 now. So, but there's that connection. And back then we would hang out and we would party together and we created a lot of great memories. And also we had many hours of really good conversation as well. And one particular time that really stands out for me was, and I don't know, Ange, if you remember this, but we were going to see a psychic medium. We were invited to this party at a friend's house of mine. And so Diane and Ange and I, we drove out together. And Diane was complaining that this was a bunch of bullshit. I don't believe in psychic mediums. Why are we spending this $50? It's a waste of money. So anyway, the funniest thing about that night was that once we got there and we got settled and we were sitting around in a circle, the psychic turned to Diane and asked her who Anthony was. And Diane immediately started crying. And I turned to her and I said, so much for bullshit, right? But she started crying because Anthony is actually her dad who had passed away. And she was just blown away by that. 
And then a little while after she talked with Diane and, you know, gave her some information about her dad, the medium then turned to Angie and was talking to her about her career. And out of nowhere, the medium tells Angie that she's going to permanently move to California. And I think at that point, Angie didn't have any intentions of moving to California. But I'm going to leave that for Angelina to fill you in. But for now, I just want to provide you with a little bit of background information about Angelina Barbieri. And so she is a second generation Reiki practitioner. Her first experience with Reiki was with her aunt in 2009, who had studied under, and I hope I don't screw this up, Doi Hiroshi, Hiroshi in Panama yeah, City. Gotta- was that close enough? Okay. And at the tender age of 12, yeah. Angelina knew that she wanted to be a model and an actress. And by the time she turned 17, she was traveling to Milan, Italy on a modeling contract. And for the next 12 years, she lived in New York, LA, and she traveled around the world doing what she loved the most. And that was modeling and acting. And later on, Angelina permanently moved to Los Angeles, California, and she became a certified Reiki master, all while landing roles and booking print jobs. It was at this point that she was really blending her two careers. And then in 2016, her heart felt it was time to part ways from the entertainment industry. And she's currently living on the Central Coast with her husband and two children. Angelina's goal is to deepen her Reiki practice and to use her intuitive gifts to help people find and speak their truth. She believes that it is possible for anyone to live in their light. And without further ado, let's welcome Angelina Barbieri. Thank you so much for joining me here today. I know how busy you are with two little ones and juggling your business. And so I'd like to say welcome. And I want to start by asking you, you, my first question is in your bio, you say that you knew from the age of 12 that you wanted to be a model and act. Tell me what that knowing was all about for you. What was it that just made you feel that this is what you wanted in your life at such a young age? Thank you, Susan. It's so wonderful to be here. Yes, that's a, you know, it's, and I, I wrote there in the bio 12 years old, but I remember at the age of eight, it was the reaction or the inner feeling that I had when I saw a Victoria's Secret model walkway show. So back in the 90s, I know out of all the things, I think maybe because they were angels too, you know, that was just very much, it was back when Tyra Banks, Heidi Klum, it was like the height of Victoria's Secret. Really just, it was probably like one of the most luscious, you know, fashion shows that was on you know cable television right and I just saw it and I was like I want to be that I I feel that seeing that externally I thought wow like if they look that gorgeous and they have these big wings and that they must feel like that too I mean look at at them they're smiling so yeah, I really connected with that. And by the age of, yeah, eight, by the time I was 12, I was like fully so- sold. But yeah, and then seeing actors on TV as well. And, you know, Pretty Woman, again, like these were, you yeah. know, <laughs> very like sexy, feminine, you know, women that were coming up in this time. Did you realize your own beauty at that point? Like, because, you know, you are gorgeous. So did you know that like were you confident enough in that at that age no. <laughs> not at all that's the funny <laughs> part right I was kind of dorky I had the glasses kind of the same thing right later on in my career even 
you know, and it, it was, yeah, I did not hold that. Later on in my career, I remember an agent saying, you know, you're like an ugly duckling. And one day you will become a swan, you know? So it really, yeah. <laughs> so. That's crazy. That is really crazy. Do you believe that at that time, was your career in alignment with who you were at that time? Well, when I got to Italy when I was 17 years old, not at all. I did not know who I was. I really was trying to reach for anything outside of me to make me feel and 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 be that image that I had seen in these magazines that I had seen on that TV on those on those runways. It, it's it's easier said than done, right? Yes. <laughs> I didn't understand the happiness as an inside job uh, at that point, right? Right, right. I get you, yeah. What did you find unsettling about that time in your life? Like what were the highs and what were the lows of a young single woman living on her own, not knowing many people and working on building this career that you had, which I'm sure was also highly competitive and cutthroat and a lot of drama that went along with it. Was that challenging for you at such a young age? It was, it was. I I, I feel like the highs of it was, you know, that I knew that if I worked hard and if I had a lot of grit, I would make it. I just had that inner confidence under it all. I think I got that a lot from my mom. My mom oh. really showed me that you can, you know, re rebuild yourself over and over again, as I saw her do, you know, changing a career path and working really hard, even though, you know, she had me and she was a single mom for the most part. And so that was like, I think I had that as like a really strong, strong foundation. And um, that's great. But yeah, it really helped Mom, me. Yes. Yeah. Mother women influences are everything when especially when you're starting out on your own, you know. Yes. It was extremely difficult with the competition, especially because I, I, I wasn't, you know, per se the, you know, the tall five eleven, you know, I was more five seven, which is like now models are all different shapes and sizes. But back then it was like you needed to be really tall, super thin. And there were a few models um that Kate Moss, I believe, that was five seven. And I was like harping on a dream with that. I was like, I'm like Kate Moss. I'm five seven. And, <laughs> and I remember going into the agency with really, really long pants on and super high heels. So I would pass for five, eight. Yeah. And when they told me to take off my shoes, I, because they wanted to like measure me and I was so nervous, but the grit is that I stood on my tippy toes because I had these really long pants. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who I was trying to fool, but you know, it was like that illusion, right? It kind of goes to show how that industry is. It's a lot of smokes and mirrors, yes. right? So I was in between those two worlds, like really trying to fit into something that necessarily, I don't want to say wasn't where I fit in, but it's like I kind of morphed into it with time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's incredible. So I give you a lot of credit because it does take a lot of grit. And even if you don't have full self-confidence, you still have to portray yourself as being confident, even if you have these insecurities inside of you, which clearly the sum of your insecurity was that you weren't tall enough and that's what they were looking for. And, but you persevered, you didn't let that stop you, which I think is incredible because those are the things where you start talking in your head and saying all the negative stuff, who would want me? I'm not good enough. I'm not tall enough. This one's more beautiful. So you have to really like give yourself so much credit at such a young age because let's face it, 17 year olds, they don't have that kind of confidence in themselves. They really don't. And I think 
probably social media must make it worse than it was yeah. when you were 17 because we didn't right. have that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't have that. There was nothing to compare despair right. like, immediately on your cell phone. I was very lucky for that. The, the photography was all still for the most part print. They were just getting into digital and it was like, whoa. And even that in itself, right? You would get like an immediate photo. It's not like you had to wait. So yeah, it, it, and, and Photoshop was just starting out as well. So again, like the manipulating of the photos and all that was like interesting because there was a lot more of that done, which yeah. probably helped a little bit to like push me in the direction, which is like, horrible to say but also just how it was at that time yeah. um, and now we're going into AI stuff like all this mm. it's just it's just nuts like just in t almost 20 years how it's just I can't this is crazy but um, <laughs> yeah it it was finding your niche market right like there's something for everybody out there don't give up you know right, right. exactly it's such a great lesson it really is. So what were the highs and what were the lows? Like, how was it as a single woman? Were men coming on to you? Were, were there sexual advances? Was there anything like that going on where like, if you do me a favor, I'll help you out or I'll get you in front of the camera? Did you have any of that kind of thing going on? I'm sure, right? Yeah, it was all very you know, at that time, very kind of like just women, very objectified. Yes. And it was before the Me Too movement. So it was still very hush hush. I didn't play very good at it because I was like, uh, you know, but it was uncomfortable because it's like you knew that you were being seen like that yes especially when you're in modeling or acting where it's you know extremely just like you know what you're seeing on the outside but I had really good representation so once I got to New York and I was represented by a boutique agency found my niche market with commercial agents doing modeling work. I then I felt like I was being held. I could trust where I was going, the people I was seeing, my bookings, everything didn't feel like a little sketch or like, hey, you're just going to meet this photographer in his hotel room, which happened to me a couple times really early on, like when I was 17. By the time I was 19, got into New York, hit my market and was repped correctly and like, you know, kind of went through the BS growing pains, right? Then it was really good because I was, I got a hang of it. I got, so I got my confidence. I knew my market. I knew what I was doing. I knew my look. I was growing into from being a little girl into being a young woman, you know, so I did a lot of like lingerie, right? So I was becoming that Victoria's Secret model that I wanted to be. I was doing commercial, you know, I was doing Maybelline. I did L'Oreal, just a lot of beauty stuff. And at times, you know, just fake it till you make it. I remember going, and that was really cool. I remember going for a hair box audition and I was going three, four times and they would put me on hold. Like they, you know, like as an option that they were going to book me and then they never booked me. And I always, when I see them, I was so excited with my book and, hey, I'm Angie. And, you know, they were like, oh, you know, because of the way the industry is. And I said, you know, this time I'm going to pretend I don't care. And I remember going in like super, like, you know, I don't care and just gave him my book. And I was like, oh, hey, I booked the job. <laughs> it's like, you know. The attitude, right? And yeah. Showing that you want it, you're a little standoffish, and that that's what pulled you in. <laughs> you know, the nature of the beast, the yes. nature of the beast, that's just kind of how it is in that world, you know? And so, like anything, though, but if, if I come back to how I live my life now, right, if you hold something with a light, with a tight grip, if you 
hold water with a tight grip, you can't catch water. But right. if you hold it gently with the palm of your hand, you might be able to cup a little bit of water and enjoy that water to drink it. So that, right. you know, the lessons they still, you know, still stem through. And yeah. I was just in a different way I was doing it before, I guess. <laughs> I know, but you know, listen, you started out young and, and you started to probably see the way the industry works and you caught on and the attitude of not showing that you are desperate for the job is what makes you even more attractive to, for them to want you, right? Because you're, you know, nonchalant about it. You don't look like you need it. You're desperate for it. You're starving. It's your next meal is coming from this job. You know? So it just, it changes your whole persona of who you are. And I think as you started getting older, you develop that confidence where you, you know, in the beginning, you weren't as confident and you right. were, you were looking to break into the industry. When we met, we were all partying and we were having a great time all, you know, we, right. We'd get together on a Friday night. We'd order food. We'd be drinking. We'd be laughing, hanging out. And then one particular Friday night, I think it was that you came over and you announced that you were getting sober. So, you know, whatever you feel comfortable, but can you speak about that process what brought you to the decision to abstain from alcohol? And also, I do remember Diane and I talking to you on occasion about Al-Anon and about AA, but just general stuff. And I think it had more to do with what my experience with alcoholism was all about, which was my spouse. And Diane had relationships where she was in an alcoholic relationship. So we had a lot of experience with that. But what was it that was like the main contributing factor, maybe, let's say, that said, you know what, I'm going to get sober? Because I didn't see you as someone who had a problem with drinking. I saw you as someone who had fun on a Friday or a Saturday night, letting loose a little bit and having fun. So what was that all about for you? Thank you so much. This is such a lovely question, Susan, because I, I don't really talk about it too much because, you know, in sobriety, we really honor anonymity. Yes. So it's really, it's kind of nice to be able to tell a little bit of my story. So part of gaining that confidence, right? <laughs> the mystical drink confidence you know it was a way to fill me in I knew that I why was I drinking that's always the question was I you know drinking and just have a good time or was I clenching onto it to give me something you know I think if we can really check to see where our motives are when we do something it can give us an indication of like is this a healthy choice that I'm making is this like just for fun or is there like some kind of like crutch cheers. There's something going on here that isn't healthy. So I was doing that a lot to cope, right? To cope with like the difficulties of being in the business I was in, of being in alcoholic relationships with other, you know, which is what Al-Anon is for, right? Friends mm -hmm. and families of alcoholics growing up around it, you know, and just trying to really control people, places, things, you know, which is why I probably... I feel there was a part of me why I liked the modeling because it's like, if I could look a specific way, if I could act a specific way, then I was going to be seen as beautiful, as fit as this or whatever. When really I, I had a lot of internal pain, you know, mm -hmm. I had a lot of internal pain and I didn't fully, I didn't stop drinking until I got to California when I was 25 years old. So that, that, you know, that part of my journey that led me to California by 25, I moved to California. I got into Al-Anon first and because I was just so rampant on saving other people and I was just emotionally hitting this emotional bottom, mm -hmm. um, everything that I had seen on like, you know, as a young girl on TV, externally, I had all those things going for me. I was at 
I was at a very um, ripe time in my career, you know, in your mid twenties, you know, you're at your prime, but I really was emotionally struggling. You know, I partied a lot in New York. I worked a lot. I mean, there was not one audition I did not go to. Right. You know, that was that grit. So it was starting to wear on me by the time I was in the winters. I'm from Florida. My, <laughs> You remember me in the winters? You said, I was like, oh, I can't do this. You know, I mean, you guys are showing me the hand warmers. I mean, it is just like, I totally, you know, so I by, the fourth of winter, that. <laughs> by the fourth of winter, I was like, I'm out of this mess. I can't do this. Um, by the time I got to California, I was ready. There was something about it that, you know, it started with Al-Anon and then two years in, I still just felt so emotionally burdened. Whether I had one drink or five drinks, I just felt depressed for days on days after. And that's what led me to get sober. And I'm actually nine years sober this Friday. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations. Oh my God. I know. I was like, oh, what divine timing. I know. What a blessing. Perfect. Perfect. And it's easy now, right? Like this. Yes. No, it's easy. It's a, it's a hard road. Yeah. Because it's raw, right? It's not like, oh, I can't wait to have a drink at the end. I had a hard weekend with the kids and I just was like, went to the grocery store and I got a chocolate chip cookie and sat in my car and just ate it for five minutes in silence. But then I tell myself, like, I'm a sober mother. Like, I'm not, you know, every day when I wake up again, like, and there's like healthy, you know, if it's just one drink, whatever, a couple drinks, you know, but emotionally and mentally, I can be there for my kids. So does your husband drink at all? Is he a social yeah. drinker? Yeah, he's a social so, drinker. He's a normie, as we would say. Right. <laughs> and it's totally you know, fine. It. If you yeah. go out to dinner and he orders a glass of wine, you're cool with that. And yeah. there's yeah. I love it. It's I love so it. much easier. I know. It does get so much easier. It I does get so easier. It's when you get it's just that like that inner knowing that I knew of what I wanted to do when I grow up. Right. It's the same with that inner knowing that even if I am alcoholic or not. In my journey on this earth, I need to be sober. Like, you know, and that's why they say in program, just all you need is a desire to stop drinking. I'm like, okay, well, I have that. So I'll just go off that. And yeah. I have. You so know. what has improved in your life since then? Like, you know, <laughs> what has improved by taking alcohol out of the equation? I guess waking uh, up in the morning feeling good. Yeah, so a lot of... <laughs> Right. Yeah. Right. I don't feel like shit. That's one. <laughs> That's part of where my self-esteem comes in. Right. Because it's a disease of the mind, right? Yeah. It's an allergy to the body, but primarily it's because the one drink, just something in the brain, it just doesn't metabolize well. Right. So I have a lot more peace of mind. You know, I really believe I am the person that I align with the person that I say I am and that I walk every day to be. Yes. I love yeah. that. Yeah. That that's what it's given me the most, you know, and just like these really beautiful principles for, a, you know, a way of living. Yeah. yeah. It would be like a health coach coaching women to eat this pristine diet. And then I go <laughs> and eat a gallon of ice cream after I yeah. eat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're not authentic. It wouldn't make wow. you authentic. So that in itself is freeing in a way, right? A like lot of freedom. That's Susan, what a wonderful word. I would say in that's the, you know, that's part of it, right? This, this freedom from the bondage of self. Like, I just don't feel like I, you know, I felt like a slave of like just my feelings and my emotions and, um, yeah. And I'm just so, yeah, there's so much freedom now. Oh, Do you favorite. find that you're more spiritual or you're able to connect with your higher power more so than you ever could when you were drinking? Or did you not even try to connect with your higher power when you were drinking? Yeah, that's a wonderful question, too. Absolutely. It's a lot more clear because I did. I think I part of, you know, it was that I was seeking, right? They even say... Yes with alcohol, you know, they call it 
spirits, right? With like yes. the dark liquors, because people it's like connecting with spirit. Right. But the thing is, it's it's a mind altering substance. Right. So we can get to the same place with meditation, yes. connecting with stillness, connecting empty with our breath connecting to the Reiki precepts right which will you know we discuss as well it's it, but that's the thing so I was always connecting it but part of it was what the coming down from it right and that's the disease that's the dis-ease that it, yes. it, it comes into the body at least for me not for everybody right yeah. so that you know as for part of my story so or my experiences. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have family members who some are alcoholics who no longer drink. But I remember in my family, my cousins who were older than me, there were a couple of them who they would drink and, you know, have like a fun night. And then for the week following, they would be in a depression where they weren't able to get up to go to work. So they'd lose time at work and lose time in life because that was the effect of one night of binge mm -hmm. drinking, I guess. And not everyone gets like that. I know because I was married to an alcoholic and he wasn't, he didn't have that kind of a reaction, mm -hmm. but some of my family members did. So I think it must be something chemically also in some way where it does yes. that to you but yes I've seen firsthand in my own family that drinking would lead to a week or so of depression yeah it's a very sneaky disease yes it really comes in all different ways it shows up in all different kinds of ways it's it's not just you know one like that you drink all can't stop you know it's it does it it shows itself in a lot of different ways and i think at the end of the day it really comes down to being really honest with ourselves right you know and that's that like that whisper and that might not even mean that like you know again that you like qualify as alcoholic and go to program or whatever but just that if it does you service or not in your life right well, again right. what's my motive what's my intention behind this Right. So. Okay, so now you're in California and you get sober. When you first moved to California, I think you started in the wellness industry. You were teaching spin classes, right? When cycling actually started when I, I started cycling when I got to San Luis Obispo. That was like my, my creative outlet once I got here to San Luis Obispo at the end of, in 2017. I started doing that when I got to California in 2011, I started getting into like the spiritual realms, like per se, like the new age, right? Mm -hmm. This new age healing modalities, which is, you know, a lot of them have, you know, there's so much of it in California, you know, the green yeah. smoothies, the green juice and yoga and all that. It's like California, man. So I'd come <laughs> from New York and I was just like, screw you. I don't want to do that, you know, to like Zen, like all this, whatever, but everybody's wearing like the best kind of clothes and all the things. Right. Um, and yeah, so I was introduced to that and I that's when I got introduced to Reiki, a very western form of Reiki, you know, which is hands-on healing, you know, that's that's usually what that you know kind of entails, more like it's more focused on hands-on healing. And uh, and so I was starting to like an angel cards and working with angels. So that's kind of what I started with like uh playing with around on, like as I was still acting and modeling a bit when I got here to California. I wanted to ask you about the Reiki. So hands-on, meaning that you actually physically touch the body? So it can be hands-on or hands-off. Because I learned hands-off. Right. So I normally do hands-off as well. Sometimes I might place my hands on someone's crown on the top of their head, but I feel more comfortable with hands-off, you know? So it just depends. But you always speak to your client or the person that you're working with beforehand, you know, and you can talk to them. 
Do you do any virtual Reiki sessions? I do. Yes, I do vir virtual because energy is energy, right? Yes. So that's the yes. beauty of it. You know, when I first got certified myself in Reiki, I got certified online and I was apprehensive. It was during COVID and I was apprehensive because I wasn't quite sure if I was going to really be able to connect with the energy virtually. I was like, I don't know, is this going? But it's a miraculous thing because when they did the the attunement on me, I totally felt it. I was laying on my living room floor. I started crying. I was very, very emotional. And then when I started practicing Reiki and doing it virtually in the beginning, I was a little like unsure and like, are they going to feel my energy? <laughs> you know, but it's incredible because it really it works virtually just as well as it does in person. And, you know, a lot of people that I've done it on, well, aren't you supposed to touch me? And I'm like, no, I don't. Even if I'm in person with you, I don't lay my hands on you. Mm -hmm. Basically, mm -hmm. you just hold your hands and the energy knows where it's needed to go. Absolutely. Energy will flow where it needs to go. Ray is universal life force energy or ray is spiritual spirit and then key is life force energy so it's spiritual energy primarily right. and it's it's everywhere it's in us it's in every person so yeah it is beautiful that when okay. that can radiate and the person feels that bright light within them that they already that they have that it's already there yeah you know yeah, it's incredible. I had gone to see a psychic medium. I don't remember. Oh, I, I know. It was like 2013. And when I sat down at the table, she said, could I see your hands? And I like put my hands out and she said to me, you're a healer. I feel that I feel your energy is very, very strong. And you're a healer. And I'm like, no, I don't know anything about that. And she said to me, she said, you know what your issue is? You gravitate towards people who need healing, but they don't know that they need it and they don't want it. She says, you need to find mm -hmm. people who need healing and want it. So basically she was talking about at that time, I think I was still with my ex-husband. She was talking about my ex-husband because, yes, I was always trying to make him better. Mm -hmm. But he didn't want to be better, you know? So I was I was directing my energy in the wrong direction at that point. And I was like that with a lot of people that I felt like they needed me to help them to improve where they weren't looking for my help. So once I started to realize, yeah, I need to redirect my focus and stop trying to help people who are not looking for my help and gravitate to people who do need it. And so, it, you know, the whole thing is really, it's, it's very interesting with Reiki and it's really changed my life a lot as far as I could pick up on people's energy right away now. Yeah, it really is beautiful. And it's I, I think one of the beautiful things too of Reiki is that the more that we connect with it ourselves, and we use, you know, the beautiful healing qualities of Reiki, then we emanate that. And it's just, you know, for a long time, I believed that I had to protect my energy that I had to shield it, you know, and I do, that's changing for me right now, because I'm realizing that when you emanate bright white light, which is yeah. your true essence, your true being, which is Reiki, you don't need to protect yourself, right? Because it's just light. And when we are protecting, and we're in fear and worry, then we're not in our bright light. So the more that we can get in touch with that, and we can do that through sitting in meditation, through sitting with the Reiki precepts. So the Reiki precepts are a really big way of leaving and the foundation of, you know, Reiki that, you know, the founder Usui Mikao, he that created Reiki Ryoho, you know, this form of healing 
it's all it's always been around right from right. forever we've been putting our hands on the the might the healing touch right or when you someone's hurt you put your hands over them so we've always had that but there's this there's this beautiful essence of it it's like that we all have it and instead of like protecting it when we feel we might be around somebody that their energy is negative per se or whatever really if we just have light then that is compassion and kindness and that's like the biggest form of healing of all and then it it cuts that duality right? right which is how so much of the world is right now it's this or that you're here or you're there you know and it just splits us in half yeah so that's just a little you know something that I've been munching on recently (laughs) a little perspective shift so you went to California and you were modeling an actress and then you got into energy healing were you looking for a husband and a family life or was that so I was I'm always looking I was always looking. Okay. Yeah, I, I had this intuition that I was going to meet my husband in California. Oh. I can't remember. I think the psychic might have said that too. Well, she definitely said you were going to be living permanently in California. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. And I was like, oh, is my husband going to be there? And I think she was <laughs> like, yeah. And I was like, oh, good. Girls got to get walking. You know, <laughs> that's a very, there's that grit. So, yeah. Excuse me, There, that definitely was, yeah, that's something that I definitely wanted, you know, in my life. So, but I was still a mess when I got to California. So Cal- I feel like California, you know, my journey brought me to California to heal, to yeah. heal myself, become the person that I really truly am, that inner bright light, that, that you know, that person that I there it was just kind of clouded a little bit and then that's when I was able to finally meet my husband which is a wonderful man you know and just my person and Mm -hmm. I was and I met him sober too which I'm like you are so lucky (laughs) when you you met John were you still modeling I was still modeling yes I was still modeling yeah, we were, t- it was like still when people were still on like starting the date on Tinder and it was like really hitting it off. It's not oh. how it is now that everybody meets like that for the most part. And it was like, oh, this thing actually works. I guess is I'll give it a try. You met it's him on stuff. Tinder? You met him on I Tinder? I met him on oh. Tinder, yeah. <laughs> he still says a coffee shop to this day. But I'm like, it's not taboo anymore, honey. Like we can say this and it's not like, oh my gosh, you know? But back then it was like just starting to get like people were getting engaged and some people married and they're like, whoa, this is like a thing. Like it works. Yeah, so weird. that is. Yeah. So was it at, after you met John and you were dating and you fell in love? Did you feel like that career just didn't work with your new lifestyle? And yeah. And it wasn't yeah. aligning any longer. And plus you were starting to really get in touch with who you truly are at your core, because now you're completely sober. Everything just changed for you. And you were able to really see the true you. And so my question is, so you found true happiness. Yeah. And it's a, it's a daily practice, right? Because the mind is always there wanting to fix and solve a problem. Yes. You know, those clouds are coming in and there's another storm. You got to be careful. So you know, <laughs> that's why there's so much power and gratitude because life can be hard. It still is. Life is lifey. Yes. But I have these tools now. I have a grounded sense of reality, which I did not have before. Right. So in that part of life is that things are always changing and they're always evolving. So just trying to be more like like water liquid with that, right? Where before it was like, I'm this person. No, I'm now I'm going to be this person. Now I'm going to be a mother. Now I'm going to be a wife. No, I'm going to be a businesswoman. And it's like, well, I'm all those things. Right. And then I'm also nothing. 
I'm just boop, like a little, like a little stardust in the universe, which sounds like so cliche, but it's the truth, right? right? We put so much emphasis on getting to this final destination when it's just like this moment, this moment, right? You know, exactly. like, and here we are, like this moment with you, like we get to do this, Susan. Like, I, mean, <laughs> I love you so much. I still have you on my phone as, as Susan, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. That is how I've always, because whenever I'd see you, there's just happiness, right? So good. From the day you were From barreling day. through the train <laughs> and you were like, I was like, where is this girl rushing to? Because you were going from one car to the next. Oh, and your I hair was beautiful. And you had these sunglasses on and you just had this like vibrant energy about you because let's face it the train is packed there's people all you know you just put your blinders on you don't look at anyone you don't like don't look at me I won't look at you but you know you <laughs> open so the true. door <laughs> and I looked up and I was like oh my god like yeah I never saw you on the train usually you see the same people every day because yeah you know, all on the same yeah you do before. isn't that crazy yes yeah I never saw you before on the train and then you walk into Diane's apartment five minutes after I'm there and I was like I remember that now I remember what glasses you're talking about those to me at that time there was something about them that gave me so much power they I, I did. Don't know they were. I just something about them, you know. It's 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 funny because I and who knows where I was going. I was always like I had to be somewhere, but I really didn't, you know. You were going to Diane's house. I know I was going to Diane's, but with such a vigor. <laughs> So you must have been walking like maybe to the back of the train a little bit more to get out. Yeah, right by yeah that's office. probably what it was. And I, you know, I wasn't, but, and anyway, it was crazy that day. And that's the way we met. There's one other thing I wanted to talk to you about. And that was, you mentioned to me when we did the first interview about that you battled with postpartum depression a little bit. After you first, really, yeah. the second one wasn't so bad. How was that? Like, how, how did you manage through that? That was really difficult that, you know, again, I think there was attachments and expectations of labels, right? I put, I was now, I left my career and I was like, I'm done with acting, with modeling. I'm a mother, I'm a wife, right? So that's what I did. I clicked, I put myself from one box to the other, which is extremely difficult to do. I left all these big cities and then I moved to like pretty much like a very small town 15,000 people, 40,000 people were 15,000. And then the big town next door is 45,000 people. Wow. I mean, like, yeah, I know. Right. Cows, goats, the things, you know, I super love it. Beautiful. <laughs> I love it. But I was not prepared. And also when I had my daughter I had an extremely difficult birth and that led to an emergency C-section and it actually brought up a lot of my trauma you know, trauma from prior abuse. And, you know, you just never know how it's going to come up. So I, my physical and emotional nervous system system was completely shocked. And then I had this baby. And so it was just, it was horrible, you know, but it was the best gift because it was where most of my innate healing has been. You know, I got the right help. I use my resources. I'm all about external help, especially for postpartum. You know, if you need medication, if you need a psychiatrist, psychologist, whatever it is, if you're in the right hands, you do what you need to do to take care of yourself. Because if something doesn't feel right, it's probably not right. Don't, a lot of times as women, we want to do it like, oh, you know, knuckles down. And, and, and I know for your generation as well, it was very isolating postpartum for women. Yeah. Now there's a lot of resources. Yes. So, you know, like we shouldn't be scared to use them. And then, you know, from all that healing with my, with my son, it was, it was like redemption. My daughter gave me that strength, that inner strength from within. And then my son, I was yeah. able to have a successful, yeah, V back, you know, vaginal birth after cesarean. And that's, that's really big for, you know, yeah, for that kind of the birth that I had originally. So yeah, there's just so much healing in every 
thing. You just never know how it's going to come at you. (laughs) Right. I know. So what would be one message that you'd like to have your listeners on here? Like, what would be a message that you'd want to yeah the yeah. i think the biggest message i would say is never doubt that there is a bright light inside of you that it is emanating whether you know it or not whether you are battling difficult times whether you are going through depression whether you know whatever might be happening it's there It just might be a little clouded with things that get in the way, right? Fear, worry, anger, but that's part of the human condition. But we have, we can get through those things, you know, and, and that just to trust that and, and have self-love and compassion as well. That is huge. That's beautiful. Angie, where can people find you if they want to follow you on social media? Absolutely. Thank you. I'm on Instagram. You can find me at Angelina underscore Barbieri. And so that right now is primarily, and then my email is there as well to get a hold of me and I'll be floating around. So if anyone (laughs) wanted to reach out to you to maybe schedule a virtual Reiki session with you, they could contact you through your Instagram account, right? Yes. Yes. Angelina underscore Barbieri. B-A-R-B-I-E-R-I. And yeah, send me a message on there and I would love to connect with you. I'm in the process of getting my website together. So oh, you should great. have that soon with AngelinaBarbieri.com. Yeah. So Excellent. in the next few months. Yeah. So I already I got that domain. We're working on it. So you know, at least I know that one's mine. <laughs> for now. Very nice. Very it nice. Does. Angie, thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you as a friend, as a mom. Your story is wonderful. It resonates so much with a lot of my own experience. So I think it's wonderful. Thank you so much. Susan, thank you so much. Love you. Love you.